so much dr punita so it is my uh, pleasure to introduce the eminent physicist professor annapurni uh, professor annapurni subramaniam received her phd in 1990 from department of physics iit chennai her phd thesis title was on magnetic and electrical behavior of certain hydrogenated rare earth transition metal system she completed her post doc in 1990 from iit chennai and another from national physical laboratory pune new delhi in the year 1990 to 93 she started her career from university of delhi as a lecturer from 93 to 96 then reader from 96 to 2001 after that she joined the department of physics university of allahabad uh, for a period of 2001 to 2002 and again joined university of delhi in 2000 Uh, 2 to 2006 as a reader and became professor in 2006 to uh, which she is till till date she was engaged in several administrative assignments as a coordinator mtech nano science and nano technology provost rajiv gandhi hostel for girls uh, uh, dhaka complex managing committee dolatram college keshav mahavidyalaya lady irwin college and ramlal anand college kirodimal college so dr preeta please kindly continue Ma'am, I will make a different introduction for you, sure, which sure. I think will be everlasting. <laughs> I always do this. So uh, it, it's one thing to get lots of degrees and to be capable of doing many things, research and so on. And first and foremost, I would like to say that her in first introduction is she is a humane person. So a person who is a pro-human being and. That is one aspect of her character which would remain in memory. Maybe one would not remember the n number of research things that she has done, so many students that she has guided, and so many people who have got under PhD under her. But people will always remember how many students she has motivated, how many girls she has inspired, how much, how much with what, how much empathy and affection she deals with other human beings when they come to her. with a problem which is not even physics wise which is not even connected to physics so being concerned for the other person's uh, problems and uh, being concerned with the other person's status regarding any problem is a thing which remains in heart forever and i will remember her for this for all my life and that i think is way above just her uh, hundreds of you know contributions in the field of science nevertheless she is an inspiration to all girls all girls and all women of our country that if you want to pursue physics and study career you must go on and sky is the limit so welcome ma'am please share your screen and yeah, deliver yeah. your talk yeah welcome yeah thanks a lot putita that was very nice of you to tell this yes definitely with ma'am the... i think that this is what remains in the brain you know uh, exactly, forever exactly you can never remember anybody's total number of awards total number of phd's and but the n number of inspiration that you have provided and the fact that your students your phd students speak highly of you and the fact that they do not want to leave your group and the fact that they want to continue working with you is the greatest of all compliments yeah some of them <laughs> actually some of them have been our students so we know first hand so we know yes <laughs> yeah i know there are many of them are from your college yes I yeah, yeah. <laughs> so our students yeah. have been your phd students and uh, we know that nobody wants to leave you and this is the greatest uh, oh. <laughs> thing to remember ma'am please share your thanks a lot vita and uh, dr bindal because this is a great thing which you are doing you know having having such type of a course for 3 months is is not an easy task we and get we really managed both of you yes tomorrow That's maybe true. we can talk about all these things <laughs> <laughs> okay ma'am let me okay ma'am please yeah, yeah. my Yeah. Yeah. Please, please share your screen. Yeah. Yeah. We were we were talking about uh, how how uh, we had uh, identified the uh, energy levels uh, for uh, in the in terms of the K space, and the next point was how did we add the electrons so that the electrons are going to occupy the uh, corresponding energy levels. but then finally the question comes when i am going to take any metal or a semiconductor what i would like to know is whether the material is being used for a transport or if you are going to look for an optical property what is going to be the contribution from the electrons is important especially when you are going to talk about your 3d 2d 1d and the zero dimension system 
this is this is going to play important role because we all know that whatever properties of a metal you talk about whether it is a superconducting property a magnetic property or it could be a sort of a transport which you are trying to see whether things can be used as a transistor device all of these actually needs the electrons and the knowledge about what is the energy level these electrons can occupy yeah so what happens is in this case what you want to see is since we are looking at a large number of levels remember in the band theory of solid what we talked about is there are going to be n number of atoms which are going to be present so if i take the bulk of the sample the n is going to be so huge so which essentially mean there are going to be n number of orbitals and one minute orbitals ma'am ma'am the screen is yeah. not getting shared the screen is not shared sorry sorry yes yes uh is the device from which you are speaking yes yeah now it is shared now it is not yeah? yeah yeah share share i able to share see too. yes yes density yeah. of state okay. yeah sorry ma'am sorry to disturb it's shared na no? so and you yes, can hear me also yeah okay. yes ma'am thank you uh, yeah yeah that's fine so so what what we saw yesterday was that we considered a number of atoms and a number of n number of atoms which is, which gave rise to n number of molecular orbitals so from every atom we are considering the contribution or a single valence electron which is present which is again a huge number so what we are seeing is that what we formed yesterday was in terms of the case space we saw that there are discrete points which we identified in which we were filling up the electrons okay and what you will see is since my n is going to be a huge number since n is going to be a huge number since n is going to be a huge number what you will see is rather than having a discrete spacing you are going to see a continuous energy band in fact yesterday somebody was asking regarding this where we will see that when i am going to look at these levels what you are going to see is that they are going to be continuous energy levels i am not going to have any discontinuous level so i put it as a band this is what i have written if n is very large n is very large what you will see is this is going to be continuous level present here but then what do i understand by density of states here what we say is we have a number of states are available you uh, each, each of the state being occupied by a up spin and a down spin electron then you counted the total number of electrons which gets occupied but now i want to see that given the total number of electrons or the density of electrons what i mean by density of electrons is n by v which is going to be equal to small n which is going to be the total density of the electrons how are they going to be distributed so if they are distributed can i choose energy e and e plus d and try to find out what could be the number of electrons which can be there this is what you call as the density of states well, i would like to know that between the energy say top most energy here which is ef we all know for the case of a metal between this and some chosen energy ei let me say or an ex i would like to know what is going to be the number of electrons which are present so that is what i am going to say as density of states which is defined as a number of available energy states remember first i am trying to identify the number of available energy states which will be there per unit volume which tells me how these energy states are distributed in the solid so that later on when i'm going to use it as a device i have an understanding of whether these energy states are available for it to accept the electrons okay or alternatively since we talked in terms of the k space if you remember we did it in terms of kx ky and kz with all the points which we found out which we identified here is it possible to estimate it in terms of gk of k and since we know the relation between e and k i can always go from a g of k to a g of e now 
these are all very fine. Is it possible for me to really measure or estimate this D of E? All these what we are talking is, these are the probability and the possibility. But given a real solid, is it possible for me to really test this hypothesis is the question. Unless I am going to see it experimentally, I am not going to believe whatever theory which we are doing here. So is it possible? Yes. Experimentally, there is something called as a photoelectron spectroscopy where you can allow the photons of appropriate wavelength. Please keep a note of it. It's an appropriate wavelength. Since we are talking about the energy levels which are going to be so close, which means smaller energy, your lambda is going to be very large. So if I'm, or if it is, if I can use different values of lambdas using the photoelectron spectroscopy, I should be able to look at all these energy levels and try to identify the occupancy of these electrons in these energy levels. Of course, another way of looking at it is the scanning tunneling microscope. In the case of a scanning tunneling microscope, what you do is, what you have is a small tip which will be present. I have the metal surface which is here. So I can bring this tip very close to each other so that I can look at what I call it as a tunneling current. So these are going to have atoms on top of this. So when the tip of this atom is going to come close to this, I should be able to see a tunneling current in this case. So when will I see a tunneling current? Depending or what should be the value of the tunneling current IT, this is going to depend on my G of E, which is my density of state. In fact, the whole of your scanning tunneling microscopy is based on the density of states of the tip, which is also a metal. Sometimes it's a metal, sometimes it's a semiconductor. We are not looking into that. Using this tip and the density of states here, we should be able to see that an electron can tunnel in the gap which is here. And if I'm going to give a bias, a sort of a bias here between this, which means I'm going to give a voltage between the tip and this material, then I will see a tunneling current and I can estimate these density of states. So let us remember that all that we are talking about the density of states are not simply a theoretical calculation which you are doing. You are able to see, in fact, you can look at the mapping of the electron density of states using a scanning tunneling microscope. So depending on what type of atom, whether you're using a silver, your gold, your semiconductor, your silicon or germanium, I should be able to map the density of states in this case. Of course, another advanced metal is what you call as an energy, electron energy loss spectroscopy, where you try to look at when you, when, when you put in a, a, a group of electrons here, you try to look at the loss of the energy because of the interaction of the electrons with the electrons, that also can tell you about the density of states. So here what you do is you measure what is called as a local density of states. We'll, we'll get to what this means. See, when I'm going to do the density of states, what are we probing? Because as we all know, we saw yesterday that depending on my value of K, I'm going to have a lot of, lot of electrons which are going to be present here and I'm going to stop with an EF here, which is going to be your Fermi energy. So what I will look at is around my EF, what is going to be the density of state is what I'm going to see. What is the reason for this? As I told you, here we are talking about a Fermi Dirac distribution function in which we said that my F of E, this is the F of E versus E, is going to give me a probability one here and till when, till this is going to be E of it. So, but when I'm going to do these measurements, I'm going to me measure it at a finite value of temperature. This is at zero K. So I said at a finite value of temperature, there is a possibility that I have some of these levels which gets filled up. See, at T equal to zero Kelvin, what you will see is the maximum level that gets filled up is EF, but at T greater than zero Kelvin, you might have a few of them getting filled up. So what I am probing is, I'm trying to probe some values around this E of F. This is what I said, which I call it as a local density of states by probing the states near the Fermi energy is what you do experimentally. But let us see how does it look like. I would, 
I would also like to know if I'm trying to probe these, how does it look like in a graphical way we would like to represent this. Now you can see this is one of the theoretical model which I'm showing here. In fact, what, what one does is you try to do all this spectroscopy and try to get back to your theoretical model, map it with this and see whether these are coinciding with each other. That's the way one does it, not a completely experimental one and not a completely theoretical one, but you have to look at both of these things here. Okay, so here what you can see is I'm just given a small example here, which is a density of states for copper. We know copper is a metal. And we also know from our calculations, which we did, we can identify what is going to be the Fermi energy of a copper. So once you do the experiment, what you will see is you, you have to identify your Fermi energy in this case. That's what you are seeing here in this graph here. This is a basic calculations which is done. I've given even the site. You can go to the site and then check it. So what you see is your Fermi energy can be identified. So looking at this graph, it is very clear that beyond the Fermi energy, what you're going to see is the number of states is almost zero. So whatever we have predicted is actually correct. What you see is this has gone to zero and below the Fermi energy, you can see that there are several density of states. I'm not going to look at what are the features here because when you talk about the density of states, you need to worry about whether it is at a D level, P level, S level, all these intricacies are going, you're going to look at. But overall, what you're seeing is above my Fermi energy, I do not see the states. Below the Fermi energy, I'm able to see the states. And this is what one tries to do with any material. You take a material, identify what is your Fermi level. In fact, cal by calculation, you do the Fermi level there. No, sorry, the EF, energy EF is what you find out. And from your density functional theory, you try to see what should be the density of states below my EF, almost near EF. That's what I said, near don't bother about this zero and minus y. This is going, one has to be very careful about this. Whether you are looking at the bottom of the level to be zero, or are you going to keep your Fermi level as zero, depending on that, this is going to change for you. Okay, so don't, don't uh, worry about this. This is only to tell you that above Fermi level, you're not having any density of state. Below that, you can actually see features which are occurring, which is matching with what was your some of its ex, uh, uh, work, okay? Now I will go to how do we estimate these density of states. Yeah, yesterday we were in one of these things here, yeah. We want to find out the number of quantum states in the interval K and K plus BF. What is it that we are trying to look at? We are trying to look at the number counting I told you. I said between K and K plus BK, okay? So suppose, let us say, I'm having this as my three-dimensional system. Forget about all those points which are the K points here. Okay, so that's my KX, KY, KZ, whatever it is, there I put it as a different one. So what I'm going to see is, I want to count how many number of points are present because I know what is going to be my volume. I know the total volume of my bulk system. Here what we did was, if you remember, I, I took a cube. Yeah, we took a cube and we said, this is of a length L and this is how we did. Okay, this was the L. And later on, what we said was having several number of points, I want to consider a sort of a sphere here. Now look at this. When I say density of states, I want to count the number of quantum states in the interval K and K plus DK. So how do you do? I do this by considering a small element here. This is an element, DK is what I'm considering. So at some value of K, at some value of k, between k and k plus dk, I am going to count. So this is something which you know what you can do. I take a sphere, suppose I have small balls which are 
put on a bigger sphere rather than counting everything one way of doing it is take a small shell count the number of small balls sum it over you know the diameter of the big ball you know the diameter of the small ball take one layer of the ball and then from the di diameters or the radius you should be able to estimate i am doing the same thing here what i have done is i have now made a sort of a sphere which is containing lot of k points rather than sitting and counting the whole of them what i do is i take a small strip of an element dk here and try to see how to estimate the total number that is available so that is what i have written here this is the volume element for a 3d now what is the volume element for a 3d since we started with l to be a big bulk system in this case so my volume will be 2 pi by l the whole cube because here you see here we wrote that each separation between each k point is 2 pi by l and assuming that there are small cubes which are available here i take it as this to be the volume which is 2 pi by l the whole cube now i want the differential volume what is this the differential volume is the dk which i have considered which will be 4 d by dk 4 by 3 pi k cube is what i had written here which is no 4 pi k squared into dk is the differential volume so we are considering a 3d level remember if it is going to be a 2d rather than a sphere i am going to consider a circle now in this case it is a 3d is what we are doing so in a 3d space the number of quantum states which means the number of lattice points in k space please when i say lattice points don't think of a lattice points in the real space here we are talking about the number of lattice points in the k space which we have designed right now and the differential volume element is obtained by dividing the total volume here which is this small small volume which you considered here divided by the total volume so this gives me the number of quantum states between k and k plus dk per unit volume so what i have written here is my density of states which means the number of available energy level which i counted between k and k plus dk is my 4 pi k squared dk into 2 pi l cube but remember i wanted per unit volume so i divided it by l cube gives here which is the total volume and remember that every k point which i am having has got my ms which is your spin quantum number which is going to be plus or minus half here so i have put two here which essentially means every k point is going to have a minus half and a plus half spin so i multiplied into two as i told you yesterday this is going to be important when i am going to work with magnetic system where i need to worry about the magnetic moment of the atom right now i am not considering that so i simply multiplied by 2 to take into account this ms which is here okay so my 3d density of states in k space now i have found it in terms of my k squared dk by pi squared look right now what we did was we counted the number of k points but generally when i am trying to map it with any transport measurements or any other thing i would like to prefer i prefer to have it in terms of my energy g of e so i need to convert this where i know my e is going to be equal to h bar squared k squared by 2m so e is going to be yeah yeah e is going to be h bar squared k squared by 2m i am not stressing anything about this m because later on what you will see when you are looking at the band structure i need not have my electron energy to be m not okay depending on what sort of a band structure my m also has got an effective mass which you talk about which i am not talking here right now we are assuming that this is the electron mass which is the normal electron mass which you are considering in this case since i know this i know what is de de is going to be equal to h bar squared into 2k divided by 2me so from here i can find out what is de by dk okay so what i'm going to substitute see here i have got e is h bar squared k squared by m k squared is 2 2me by h squared 
So 2K DK is 2M DE by H squared. What I'm going to do is I'm going to replace my DK. K by E and my DK in terms of E here. If I do that, my density of states, my 3D density of states, if you see, comes out to be G of 3 E DE 2ME by H bar squared into pi squared. So this is nothing but here, this is E power half into DE, which is your density of states here in terms of E if I write it. So what, is, what does it say? My G3D, forget about the constant here, which is going to depend on M. Remember this. So always you have to remember that my M here is going to depend on what is your E versus K diagram. My M need not be M0. Again and again, I'm stressing because in many of the problems, you would see that M is not given as the rest mass of the electron. It varies depending on your metal that you are going to use, okay? So what you will see is in the case of a 3D system, this is going to be proportional to root of E. My G of 3D of E is going to be root of E. Now, once I have found my density of states, where can I use this? And what are the parameters I can get? One parameter that you can get is N, which is going to be the number of electrons. Density of electrons, okay? Second, I can find out is total energy. So once I know the total energy, I can find out what is the energy density. We will say how to do all these things, okay? Energy density. And fourth, once I know energy density, I can find out the heat capacity, the specific heat capacity at constant volume. See, this is what was an important parameter. If you remember, when I did the Drude's theory, when I said, I talked about the, the error in the estimation of CV that is taken care of by this theory, by Sommerfeld theory, where I said that there was a factor of 100, which was wrong, but because there was another, another parameter velocity, which also had a factor less of 100. So everything was fine with the, the ratio of your uh, thermal to your electrical conductivity. So there we may, I mentioned that there was a wrong estimate of your CV. What you can see is that the estimation of CV there is now replaced by the Sommerfeld's theory, which could bring the theory into a proper, uh, where, where, where they could visualize what was the error that was done. Where what they did was they tried to consider all the electrons which are present, but then they realized, depending on a finite temperature, there is a fact fraction of the electrons is what is going to be considered in this case. We will do one problem and from there we will try to identify what does this, this mean, okay? So what I can do is, once I know all these things, I can determine all these parameters. But then, is this enough for me? No, what I need to do is, it's not only the density of states which is important, what I'm going to use is my Fermi Dirac distribution function, okay? The FD distribution function is what. So these are the two things I need for determining any of these parameters. You'll see why, because my F of D, if you see, okay, let me, let me get to that. Uh, yeah, uh, once you see the F of D, what you will see is, this is going to give me a limitation of at what energies am I going to consider this G of E? Because when I'm going to look for a purpose of a transport, I will be more interested in looking at G of E, which is near to my Fermi surface. Near the EF is what? I want a G, which is EF. This is what I want to look at, okay? Now, this is for a three-dimensional case. Where in a three-dimensional case, what we did was we considered that all these K points were equally distributed in all the three directions. 
Now, what happens if I'm going to consider a two-dimensional case, okay? In the case of a two-dimension, what do you do? Here you will see that I'm going to say, for example, a single layer graphene. If I, if, I, if I want to look at a good example, it's a single layer graphene, which I want to look at where I will see that along X and Y, okay? Let me take this as X and Y. I have a dimension which is L and L. L is very large. Here, I'm going to have a distance D. What you will see is D is very less compared to L. This is what I consider as a 2D system. See, in one of the dimension, I find that this dimension is very small compared to this. So, which essentially means here I'm having a 2D electron gas. It's a two-dimensional electron gas is what I'm going to have. What it says is my gas, the electron, is able to freely move along my X and Y, whereas here, because of the size which is going to be very small and compare it to your mean free path which is present, what you will see is this D size. If it is going to be in comparison to the mean free path of the electron, what I will see is my electron is not having the freedom to move in this direction. So what do I do? Then I need to find out my K. In the case of 3D was KX, KY, KZ. Here I will say my K squared is only my KX squared plus KY squared. This is what we are going to see here. Now, how do you do that? For the case of a 2D system, I said that we will consider a circle. Just consider a circle where the maximum is going to be your uh, EF or correspondingly it is your KF, which is the radius of the circle. So how do we go about? In the case of a three-dimensional system, we considered two pi by L the whole cube as the volume. Now I'm going to consider only this area here, which means I will have to consider the area two pi by L the whole squared. So now what is going to be my differential area is what? There we did a differential volume. Here I'm doing a differential area, which is my two pi by K. So two pi by two pi K is my differential area is what I have considered. That divided by the total area of this whole, this whole system since I want it per unit area. So there in the 3D density of states, we did the number divided by the total density divided, sorry, the total G of E divided by the volume. Here I'm taking per unit area. So this will be one L squared. So which essentially mean in the real space, what did I consider? In the real space, I considered the system. Yeah, here it is L and L is what we considered. This is my L squared is what we have written. So this gives me, it is K into DK by pi. Okay. Now this, I need to convert in terms of my E. I can use this relation, E versus K relation. You will see that it is just M by pi squared into DE. What you can see is it is constant. My density of state for the case of a 2D gas is going to be independent of the energy. This is what I have shown here. The density of state is for the case of a 2D system. Similarly, I can do for a 1D system, which is G for a 1D, if I try to do for a 1D system. Okay, let me put it as 1D system. How do I do? There I'm only going to consider one of this, Kx. So my K squared is just Kx squared. So what are these systems? What are the examples of these system? Suppose I can draw a metal in the form of a wire like this, which is going to have a length L. And this is going to be my diameter of the wire. Let me put it as wire. Okay. Now look at this. The electrons can freely move along my L, whereas in this region, it cannot move. Of course, it's going to depend on what is going to be the diameter of the wire. Is my diameter of the wire less than the D mean free path of the electron? Okay, 
So depending on that, I will say, no, my electrons cannot move freely here. So I want to look at what would be the density of states here. Okay. So one, one good example is casting a wire, or you can all, always say it is a carbon nanotube. All of you all must have heard about this. I have a carbon nanotube, which is a very long tube with just one small diameter, which is of nanometer size. And the tube can vary from nanometers to micrometer. So my L there, my electrons are going to freely move there. So I'm just giving examples here of how it can be done. Either I can just take a small, uh, take a silver or a gold and cast it in the form of a wire, or you look at naturally available carbon nanotubes, which are which can be made very easily in laboratory, and we all know that these are of uh, these are lot of applications. There, I would like to see what is going to be my density of state. Now, how do I do? When I'm going to look at this system, here I will only see along the kx, let us say. Okay, so which means if I say this is going to be my x direction, I want to look at what is going to be the density of states in this, in, in, in terms of kx, which I'm putting it here. That will be instead of initially I took the volume, next I took the area. Here I'm going to just take the length. So if you look at it, so my G1D, 1D of KDK, I can estimate this. This will be equal to two. Two is going to come because of my spin quantum number here, multiplied by, because I said every point is going to have a up and a down spin which is present. So here it will be my, in uh, a small a small length is what I'm going to look at, which will give me my dk here you can see that this is going to be dk divided by what is going to be my length in my case space so this is my length in my case space is 2 pi by l and what is going to be my distance here this is the distance i talk about that is going to be 1 by l so if i do that i get a density of states which is inversely proportional to e power half okay just for you to understand how these densities of states can be shown here. Just see here, in the case of a 3D system, what I have here is a, an expression which is proportional to e power half. And in the case of 2D, we have seen very clearly it is independent of e, so it remains constant for all e's. And here in this case of a 1D, it is inversely proportional to e power half then you might ask me what is going to happen for a zero dimensional system. Can zero dimensional system exist? Yes. The same metal, if I keep on breaking into smaller pieces, all of you all would have heard about the nanoscience, which is there now. This is very popular. What you do is you try to reduce the sizes, the dimensions in all the three, three direction. Then I can have a zero D material where I am going to have what I call it as a D nano is the size here. A D nano in comparison to the mean free path of the electron, if I see if this is going to be very small, if D nano is going to be less than the D mean free path of the electron, then I can see that my electrons are confined in three direction. Then you might ask me, how do I get the density of states in this case? Yes. As somebody asked me yesterday, what you will see is I'm going to have discrete levels which will be there. For a case of a three-dimensional system, what did we see? We saw that these energies were very close and I, I talked only in terms of the band. Whereas in the case of a zero-dimensional system, what I will see is I can identify discrete levels in this case. Okay. So then you might ask me, what are the applications? There I see here, in the case of a 3D, all of us have done semiconductors. Of course, I'm not going to semiconductors, which has a band gap here. Then you have a quantum well system, you have a nanowire, and you also have a quantum dot. Now, how, how is, is this possible? Then how do I see what are the energies? What I do is, at every energy here, which I talk about, I should see a sort of a delta function. In the case of a zero dimension system, 
naturally this is what you will expect my g of e if i try to plot as a function of e what should it tell so i have energy e1 energy e2 energy e3 and energy e4 and so on here so what i will see is a sort of a delta function this is what you are going to see so this corresponds to my e1 e2 e3 ideally ideally is this is what you are going to see but i know that there is always a sort of a distribution within each of these things so what you generally see is uh, so this is what you will see instead of a delta function i mean you know you know that determination of the energy where i i cannot determine the value of the energy exactly so what i see is a small distribution in this one is what you see what what i would like to tell you here is in the case of a quantum dot instead of having a set of energy levels which are going to be bad now i will see that there are discrete energy levels which are present so what is happening is as i am changing the dimension of the system starting from a 3d to a 0d system what you see is there is a marked variation in the density of states in fact this became very important for trying to explain many of the properties in the system so let us let us let us look at one of the properties for example let me take a bulk metal somebody was asking what happens to the transport let me consider a bulk metal a bulk metal where i had a density of state which was continuous and it was proportional to e power half so when i am trying to look at the transport property so let me see the ohms law what is ohms law i am just going to take a bulk of a metal okay just put a source here this is a source and this is a drain big words this is nothing but i'm just applying a potential to this okay i just apply a potential to this so if i want to measure what is my current here i okay it's a simple one you don't ask me that i just put a metal like this and i'm going to try to measure it yeah of course you use a multimeter to measure your resistance so similar to that i have a voltage source and i have a current source i should be able to measure now how does this look like when i'm going to measure this one you will simply see that this is v and this is i and this is a metal let me say this is a metal i'm not looking at semiconductors now this is a metal here how what, what would i see i would see a simple linear relationship like that for a normal bulk metal this is what i look at where i say my all my density of states or when i look at the energy levels my energy levels are continuum this is a band this is a band okay on the other hand on the other hand let me make these smaller and smaller okay so again let me put a source here and let me put a small metal here okay small metal again a source and the drain and i try to give a voltage here and let me look at the current here if i see this what am i going to get if i'm going to do a v versus i what i will see is instead of having this v versus i i will see that this is what you will see this is what you are going to see here so what i am seeing is a sort of a discontinuous iv curve is what you are measuring now why is that happening that is happening because what i said was rather than a continuous so what i am saying is this i am i am looking at the diameter the dia is d nano range is what i am looking at when i say nano range what this is something like 2 to 3 nanometers a nanometer is nothing but 10 power minus 9 meter that's going to be my dimension of this so we already know when i try to look at the d mean what is what is d mean d mean is nothing but the distance between the electrons 
for undergoing collision. This is of the order of something like 40 nanometers. What you can see is my structure is small compared to my 40 nanometers, then I'm going to see this one. Now, how can this be explained? It can be explained very well using my density of states, where I said, in the case of a zero dimension system, what I'm going to see is a sort of level which is present. So this way, I can actually control a flow of just one electron, what you call it as a single electron transport is something you can look at. Where by applying my voltage, I apply my voltage in such a way that, that every voltage which I come here, I just see transfer of single electron taking place from these energy levels, okay? So what you can see is a density of states are going to play an important role. In fact, when you consider the case of a two dimension system, the quantum Hall effect is very, very well understood using the case of the electron gas, which is present. So here I, I have simply shown here, how do you really do these wires and well? Here now, if you look at, this is my E versus K diagram. I hope you are able to see here, my E versus K. I said that if I'm considering a two dimension, why do I call it as a two dimension? I've taken two semiconductors and I've considered a small region, which is a well or a wire, which I call of another semiconductor. I can try to identify what are my energy levels here? And you will see that along my Kx and Kz, as I explained, only two regions are available where I look at the continuous energy level, then I can find out what is going to be my G versus K relationship for such type of a material, okay? Now, as I told you, there are several parameters. Say, having understood how to find out my density of states, Using these density of states which we have derived, we will find out the different parameters as I have listed here. I said I want to determine density of states of electrons. I want the total number of electrons which is participating in any of the process. Whether it is an optical process or a transport process, I would like to know this. And I would like to know what is the total energy of the electrons, energy density, and the specific heat. So once you have this, my next thing is, how do I find out this? Okay, let me go to another uh, lecture notes here for this. Yeah. Yes. Now, look at this graph here. Okay. So this is the case of a three D three a three dimensional system. Okay. Yeah. This is a three dimensional system which I have which I have shown here. See, as I told you, GE is enough for me to identify the number of energy states which are available. But that is not the end of it because I am also dictated by my Fermi energy, which has got, which tells me that I will not allow all the electrons. See, I might have energy levels which can be present at all energies. But Fermi Dirac distribution tells me I am not going to allow you to, to add my electrons beyond my E of F. So for that, I have just shown E versus G of E is what you are having here. Then you're, what you're having here is the Fermi Dirac distribution function here. Okay. The Fermi Dirac distribution puts an end to my E of F which essentially means if I draw this line here, these are the regions which are going to be occupied and these are going to empty. Remember, I have the available density of states here, but my Fermi Dirac distribution function puts me a con my energy. It says, no, you cannot occupy, these electrons cannot occupy beyond this, of course, at T equal to zero K. So which essentially means Whenever I'm going to talk about my density of state, I always, or whenever I am going to calculate my number of electrons, I have to be very clear about whether I'm going to consider energies only till E of F, or am I going to consider energies beyond E of F? And if I'm going to work on finite temperatures, I definitely have to look at energies beyond that. Now, what happens? Now, how do you find 
the total number of electrons which are present here. One is, I have found the distribution of energy. Now I want to do a number counting of the electrons. Right now, what we did was, we did a number counting of the number of K points which is present. I need to find out what is going to be the number of electrons in this case. How do I do? There, what I do is, I have over the total volume which I have considered, what I do is, I know between E and E plus DE is G of E, but then I say no, I simply cannot add all the electrons in my G of E. I am putting this condition here, my Fermi Dirac distribution function. So if when I have to count the total number of electrons over my total volume V, what I do is, it is V integral zero to infinity, because I don't know, I said my G of E can go up to infinity, D of E, G of E into F of E. So what do I do? I put my Fermi Dirac distribution function. You remember what is your Fermi Dirac distribution function? So what I do is I multiplied it by this function F of E between zero and infinity. But then what I can do? I suppose I want to find the G of E up to my Fermi, Fermi energy what I do is I change the integral. So you have to look at the problem very carefully. When you are asked to find out the number density of electron, first what you do is try to find out what is N, the total number of electrons over all my volume, which will go from zero to infinity. D of E into G of E is, see whether it's a three dimension or two dimension, you have to be again careful. My Fermi Dirac distribution function will be the same. F of E is going to remain the same. What I need to change only is my G of E depending on the dimension that is asked. So I can find out my D of E, G of E. If I want to do it at zero Kelvin, instead of going to infinity, since I know my Fermi Dirac distribution is going to stop with E of F here, I will be able to find out from zero to E of F. This is what? One thing is very easy here. My calculation is going to be easy because when I want to do at zero Kelvin, in fact, most of the times you are asked at zero Kelvin because there are a lot of assumptions which has to be done if I have to do beyond zero Kelvin. So here I know my energy is going to be only E of F. This is going to be one and this is going to be zero. So what I do is F of E is equal to one at T equal to zero K. So instead of Writing my Fermi Dirac distribution function, I simply replace it by one if I have to do it at zero K. And what happens to my energy? The limitation of energy is only EF. So I change my integral V, integral zero of E of F, DE into G of E, and at T equal to zero Kelvin, I simply put F E equal to one. Then I can, then I know what is my density of state GE. We already derived the density of states for a three dimensional system. So this is what you will see in the case. So N is going to be V into constant, integral of zero to EF at E. So what you are going to do is integrate this E power half function and replace it by my E of F. This is what you are going to get. So what I want is a density. The electron density is what I want. So what is N? N is the total number of electrons. I have this volume which is present. So I can put N total divided by the volume is going to give me my small n and I can determine my small n in terms of my Fermi energy. So if I know Fermi energy, I should be able to determine n. But if you want to find out the Fermi energy, knowing the value of n, I can do. How do I do? This is one of the problems which is very commonly asked where I know n, I can determine in a different way also for a given metal, how do I determine this? If I don't, do not know EF and I want to determine EF, what I can do is go back to your original formula for N, which is in terms of Avogadro number Na and rho, which is the density. Rho is the density of the metal that you are using, multiplied by Z, which is the valency, valency number divided by the atomic weight, okay? If I know this, I should be able to estimate N. If I can estimate N, and if I know what is mass, if mass is going to be the best mass of the electron, put that there. 
and you can estimate your EF. So this gives me an approximate method. Not approximate, it gives a really good value of my EF here. You can find out what is going to be my Fermi energy. Or if I know the Fermi energy, using this formula, I can find out N. This is for the case of a three-dimensional system. So similarly, you can do for a one dimension. So this is for a three dimensional system. I can use for a two dimension, one dimension is something which you can work out. Okay. So I can estimate this. Now, if this is not equal to zero, I get into trouble. In fact, somebody asked me what is, what is the role of your Fermi temperature? This is where it happens because my EF of T, my EF is not the same as you see in the zero Kelvin, because what happens is I need to replace in my integration here, the formula for F of E, okay? If I put back this formula of F of E, this integral is going to be a tough integral to solve. Then what you will see is I need to put in a lot of approximation, whether my T is greater than TF, T less than TF and all these things, because my Fermi energy itself is going to show a shift as my temperature is going to go larger, okay? Yeah, now, having done this, this is just apart from what we want to do. So here I have done my density of, uh, the electron density is something which you have determined. Now I can also find out my total energy. How do I find the total energy of the electrons? I have n electrons present. So there what I do is, it is V, which is the volume, integral zero to infinity, E, G of E. See, remember, when we did my N, we only used G of E and F of E. You have to find out the total energy, which means I'm going to have N number of electrons. I want to find out the total energy of the system. So multiply into E, I can get my total energy of the system. So now U is my total energy divided by V can give me my small U, which is going to be my energy density. Energy density. So I should be able to estimate my energy density using this formula. So again, again, if I want to do for zero Kelvin, zero Kelvin, I will put my F of E is equal to one because I know at zero K, this is your, your function clearly describes that it's going to be one and above EF it is going to be zero. So I can put back, put this as one and try to find out what is my U, okay? So this is what we have done here. So I can find out by U by V. So I've shown this for zero to EF and EF to infinity, which can we can get rid of this. So you have your U at zero Kelvin is going from zero to EF, E G E D. I can estimate my U in this case here. This is what you have. You know, N is this we derived and U at T equal to zero is three by five. N times into EF. So it says that if I know my value of N, if I know what is my value of EF, I should be able to calculate my total energy. So what is left is your specific heat capacity. How do I do my specific heat capacity? Here, this is what you have to do. CV is nothing but DU by DT. So once you have the expression of U, I should be able to find out du by dt from this and I can estimate my specific heat capacity. This is what was used in the case of your thermal conductivity where there was a wrong assumption of my CV. Now this gives me the right value of CV in this case, okay? So this tells me how I can get all these parameters. Yes, this is what you see. Finally, what is it that we saw? What we saw was we found that absolute zero, I did try to find out my energy as a function of K here, okay? With a condition that my EF at zero Kelvin is this, and this is going to be my occupancy. So here I have simply put the other way around. I put my D here and E here to make a comparison with this, which tells me that this is only the occupancy of the electrons. See, this is the availability of energy levels, and these are the occupancy of the electrons, of course, dictated by my F of E. So what happens? So what, what is your F of E? F of E is nothing but 
this function which you have where uh, e1 by e minus ef by kbt plus 1 is your f of e so whenever you are going to do a calculation beyond zero kelvin you have to put back this expression and do all the integration to find out your u so there is one problem we can think of is what is going to be beyond my zero kelvin you know what can be the excited number of electrons that can be thermally excited so what you do is i simply want to find out what is f of t e which means not at zero this is at zero if i try to look at i've taken the differential of this one you can see that occupancy of these electrons beyond my e of d this is delta of f of e is what i have done it tells me that there is going to be a little occupancy of this this is what is going to happen in most of your electron gases as and when i am going to give some energy kb into t where t is the temperature you will see there is going to be a distribution of electrons which essentially means that some of the electrons from here might occupy a level higher than my ef at 0 kelvin okay so this is what is an just an example i have shown yeah this is the total comparison for a 3d system 2d system 1d system and a 0d system with lot of practical applications which we can talk about uh yeah can i have another 5 minutes more 5 10 minutes more uh yes ma'am you can no issue i can have okay yes. okay i just just one problem i want to do for for uh, silver and i just want to show them how how we go about with this okay, okay. for example i i just want to find out density of state for a silver for silver okay let us estimate this Age. See why I am considering AG is remember we have done only the free electron theory. We are not going to the nearly free electron theory. I am not looking at any semiconductors. I am only looking at the metal properties in this. Okay, so AG if I consider, okay, this is going to have, it's a free electron metal. When I say free electron metal, yes, my electrons are very happily moving around. so these electrons in outer shell then you might ask me what about the bound electrons i am not talking about the bound electrons i am only talking about the outer shell r free okay so what i call it as a t localized so only my outer shell electrons are d localized here and what is the atomic weight of ag ag is 107.9 gram per mole please be careful sometimes they might give it in kg so you need to convert all the units accordingly now the density of ag again this i'm giving it in grams per centimeter cube okay now i need to find out the number of electrons per unit volume okay either they say that or they say electron density okay so this is n into v let me say we know this formula this is going to be avogadro number into rho which is density of the metal let me say density of the metal okay multiplied by valency valency in this case is 1 divided by the atomic weight so if you do that this value comes out to be 5 Point nine approximately okay. into ten power twenty two per cent centimeter cube. 
okay that's a high high number of electrons so either you say if the valency is one this will be exactly electrons per centimeter cube or it will be atoms per centimeter cube okay now what is the fermi energy of ag so let us say ef of ag is equal to 5.5 electron volts so i should be able to estimate the density of states just now we derived the expression for the density of states g of e okay use this and try to see what is the value that you're getting this will be approximately uh 1.6 into 10 power 22 what is the unit of this this is going to be density of states will be ev electron volt minus inverse centimeter you can actually convert it into joules that comes out to be approximately 10 into 10 power 46 joule inverse meter minus okay you should be able to estimate knowing uh, knowing all these parameters i should be able to estimate the density of states of course from this you can get the total energy everything this is just i have given it as a model problem for you to use this the same thing you can do for your 2d and uh, 2d 1d and your 0d system okay is that fine so what what we have seen here is we have only tried to find out the available energies the number of electrons that can be occupied on on all these energy levels but putting a restriction using the fermi dirac distribution function doing all these things once i know my density of states for a three dimensional two dimensional or a one dimensional system i should be able to get all the parameters like the total number of electrons that has occupied the total energy and then the specific heat knowing all these things i should be able to estimate the conductivity the electrical conductivity the thermal conductivity and some of the op optical properties are quite easily understandable by knowing how to solve your density of states okay this is for the case of a free electron system remember when i am there is there is one lacuna in this case what we did not address is why there is a negative there is a change in my uh, change in 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 the case of rh where i can always have it as the plus or minus this is something which we have not addressed at all the reason being in all these cases where we talked about the free electron system we only talked about metals where i know the charge carriers are only electrons but this is going to arise because if i am going to talk about other systems where other than my electrons i am going to have a sort of a positive charge which are which i call it as a hole which is going to be present which is going to give me a variation in my rh which you never see in the case of a metal i mean it's not necessary there are certain metals where there is a deviation from your minus you know rh was your minus 1 by any is what you saw in the case of a metal but there are certain metals where there is a small gap which would be present which gives rise to a plus value of minus and this could not be explained so the question is are we correct now yes we are correct up to a certain extent where i am able to explain some of the transport properties of the metals but what was the lacuna in this case the lacuna was i always considered free electrons so when i say free electrons i only say that it's a gas of electrons which is moving but when i really when i take a real system it is never a gas of electrons which is there so what you will see is that you have a immobile positive ion which is going to be present so my electron see i'm not talking about the bound electrons remember i'm not talking about the bound electrons 
we are talk we we have talked only about the electrons which are going to be the valence electron now is these are these electrons going to see a potential is the question yes in a real system in a real lattice in a real lattice what you will see is my electrons are not free this is going to see a sort of a potential so what is going to happen is my electron is going to feel a potential because of these charges immobile immobile ions which are present so i call it as immobile ions so our equations did not take care of this so which essentially means my schrodinger equation se i call it as se here i need to replace it what i will do is i will simply not write it as h squared by 2 m del squared psi equal to e psi is what we considered okay and what we did was we simply said my psi i approximated it as minus e minus kx a plane wave equation is what i wrote okay or in a three dimensional case i simply wrote it as i k dot r sorry so we simply wrote my psi was proportional to e power minus i k dot r for the case of a three dimension okay the three dimension but now how am i going to account for this potential which is present here so which means this is not the right way i am going to right then squared psi equal to e psi yeah okay so there what i will do is i need to add a potential v of r v of r which is periodic so why i say periodic i have my electron which is moving in a lattice which is having a periodicity corresponding to my lattice constant a which means i will have a v r plus capital r which is a translation which i say this should be equal to v of r what is my v of r what is my r r is nothing but n into a plus m into v plus some l into c okay so that is my translation vector which is decided for every lattice that you have considered okay any lattice that you have has got as a basic basis of a translation vector and i see that this potential on which my electrons are moving is going to be repeatable okay depending on the periodicity of the lattice so what is the result of such thing which essentially means this is a wrong assumption which i am making okay so this is what is going to be changed to your blocks function where i say i can write my psi of r as some u of r e power minus i k dot r and this u of r is again going to follow this translation so it essentially means similar to my potential which my electrons are going to feel i have modified my psi of r using my u of r which is also a periodic function what i have so i i need to follow this expression in this case so by doing all these things what i see is that when i am trying to solve this equation where i found my k i will just stop with this this is just introducing to your block function which says that since i need to worry about the potential i have to also see what is the consequence of this potential so the consequence is now in the case of a metal where i simply considered this to be my e versus k here what i says is the the presence of my potential b of r and my modification of psi of r has given me a restriction on my value of k it says that no beyond a certain value of k my electrons are not going to travel so easily what would happen is there is going to be a sort of a reflection that will take place which means i have opened up a gap in this case 
So this is nothing but my energy band gap, which I talk about, which comes in the case of a semiconductor as a result of my simplicity in saying that my electrons are free to travel. Now what I have done is I have said that my electrons are now moving over a potential as a result of which I see that there is an opening of a band gap, which was a very good news for us because there are many systems in which you see that I do not have a continuous energy level which is present. There is always a presence of a band gap, which you talk in terms of your valence band and your conduction band. Okay, so with this, I, I stop. This is a this is a very interesting one where you will see is depending on what is going to be the strength of your potential, I will see that this band gap also changes. This is a long mathematical formalism which we can do for this, where we can show how this EG is going to depend on my V of R, which is the potential that we talk about. So as a result of which there are several parameters which you have to again talk the way we did for the case of the metal i need to look at what is going to happen in the case of semiconductors where there is a gap which is created what i call it as a brillouin zone boundary this is a bz which is going to depend on what is going to be a lattice structure of your material that you are going to consider okay yeah uh, so should i stop at this point yeah yes ma'am so with this, yes, that, that was, uh, I mean, I would have loved to talk about this also. Okay, some other time when uh, we can uh, talk about these block functions and then see how we can bring in the modification in your density of states and how you can determine your specific heat, etc. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. It was such yeah. an insightful and well-explained talk on uh, solid state physics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ma'am, okay. it was like it was like yes. I, I texted to Dr. Sora that let me, I mean, I do not have the heart to stop this beautiful song going on and on and on. It's a pleasure okay. to see how one enjoys, uh, how enjoys, uh, you know, teaching and then, you know, gets, start flowing like a river inside that particular subject. And then I said, let's wait. I don't, I will not ask her to stop, <laughs> even if she continues for another few minutes. Yes. So, thank you so much, ma'am. Indeed, a pleasure. Sure, sure, sure. Ma'am, I'm sure. really requesting okay, you, please. Okay, okay. Thanks. While you, are, while you are, no, no, request is not just only request. Request is when you are teaching yeah. our students nowadays online, please record your lecture and yeah. give it to us. We'll watch them. Okay, okay. Sure. Then we, the, we'll okay, watch yeah, them. And... Yes, that, that, that's very nice. You know, this is what you finally want as a teacher. You know, you want all sorts of encouragement like this can make me you know learn more i would rather say rather than teaching more i would say i i rather learn more and, I, uh, yeah that's true i mean teaching is learning only the real pleasure of uh, physics comes only when you start teaching it and that's the yes. best way to you know enjoy it thoroughly really yeah so okay. the, I, the sad days are those days when we don't see and meet students those days yes, are not good true. days when we meet students in college and anywhere else, then interaction with them, teaching them, trying to help them is the real pleasure of life. So thank you once again yes. a lot. And Dr. Savita. Yes, yes. Sorry, Saurav. <laughs> it's okay. No problem. <laughs> I mean, you cannot really stop. I mean, it's, it's criminal <laughs> to stop somebody's song of physics going on and ask them to stop. Yeah, Savita, please stop and then start again. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I will I will take leave. Okay. Yeah, 